I'm Danny Dyer. Playing hard, men and acting tough has been my bread and butter. But now I've got a new role. I'm tracking down some of the most feared men in the world, operating on both sides of the law. I'm going to find out what makes them tick, how they got their fearsome reputations, and why they're considered to be some of the world's deadliest men. the underworld with extreme mm. violence. Mm. Even rob drug dealers. I'd lift up my balakov and say, it's me the devil. What are you going to do about it? A man who left drug dealers living in fear that he'd come knocking on their door. Mm. He's a fighter all the way through. Mm. A man they called the devil. I'm in Liverpool to meet Stephen French, a notorious gangster from Liverpool who specialised in the perfect crime, robbing drug dealers, known in the underworld as taxation. He had a fearsome reputation on the street, but I was on my way to meet the man behind the myth. For the first time, he'd agreed to open up his world for the cameras and take me into the heart of the devil himself. Even the cabbies round here had heard of him. What do you know about this Stephen French? I mean... I mean, he used to torture drug dealers. Yeah. And a lot of the drug dealers knew him as the devil. Unbelievable. You're going to take on drug dealers and, you know, you're going to rob them. Yeah. You're going into a dark world, you know what I mean? He's a reformed character now, isn't he? I just hope he's, uh, I hope he's a fan of Cockneys, you know what I mean? <laughs> Stephen had told me to take the ferry across the River Mersey and meet him at the pier. The only reason he had agreed to make this film with me was to promote his new anti-gun campaign, and I didn't know what to expect. Even though he's now reformed, in his heyday, he was one of the most dangerous men alive, and I was starting to feel nervous. Shit. Watch yourself. So here we go. The size of the geezer. Steve. Danny. Pleasure. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. I should have waited a suit on, son. You look, you look in the business. I always wear a suit, Danny. Good I man. always wear a suit. First Good things man. first, French offered to show me what around his manor. It's a lovely little motor that, though, isn't it? At 7.30, it's a workhorse. In the 80s, these streets used to belong to Stephen French. Now, it's one of the most deprived ghettos in the UK. And Stephen is still widely recognised by the locals. Stop. Talks to the subject. <laughs> <laughs> Lunatics. Some sort of mad megaphone in his motor shouting out. I don't even know them and they know me. <laughs> <laughs> but not everyone in Liverpool is so friendly to Stephen. I was about to find out that someone wanted to kill him. I'll take you to the park where a really serious incident happened to me. OK. Now, this was in November last year. This was the incident that I, I, I considered most serious. OK. It was here in Sefton Park that French nearly met his end when he found himself directly in the firing line. In November 2007, he was visiting a friend when he was targeted by a hit squad and chased into the park. I took off like a cano, got into the park, right? And I see them close to the trees, I'm there, but then they've come. This is how I know that they were fucking serious individuals, Dan. They turned the lights on into the park. And, and then one of them's got out, and he's, got, he's obviously got a handgun. The other one, but he's got a long coat on, right? And I've seen him flick his coat, so I know he's got a shotty. Yeah? Mm. I'm thinking, fuck me, I've got none. And there's this mm. pond over there. Yeah. So I've got into the pond. The water's up to there, so you can't see me. Like, I've got a three quarter length coat on, I put it over me, and I'm lying by the rocks. See, I'm right in front of you, but you can't see me. Mm. Fucking wicked. Subdiffuse and misdirection, right? Two of my oldest friends. And I'm looking through the buttonhole on my coat, and I could see them, right? And I had. Apprehension, but not for you. And it's um, a Japanese thing. I've got my phone. I've got the, I'm hiding the light on my phone. And I'm saying to you, but audio, just sound your fucking siren. Just sound your siren. Yeah, yeah. That'll be enough. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then I've come out to the pond. I'm wet up to there. 
price. And then it goes, on the fucking floor now, on the floor now. I said, I'm getting on the floor for nobody. My name's Stephen French. I phoned you, I'm not armed and I'm not getting on the floor. On the floor, I said, I'm not getting down. I'm not getting on the fucking floor. Come and say it to me, I'm not getting on the floor. I survived that attempt. I've survived over six or seven attempts on my life. But that was, they was there to fucking whack me proper. Yeah. I had no idea that taking a stroll in the park with Stephen would be so dangerous. It's not like we're doing this very stealth and it's me and him on our own, you know, sort of keeping our nuts down. We're walking around with a camera. So I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a bit on edge, to be honest with you, at the moment, you know? I'm a bit, I'm a bit like, constantly like, and I don't want to let him know that because obviously, you know, it shows a bit of weakness and a bit, I don't know, I just don't want to give too much away yet, you know what I mean? But actually, you know, I've got to say, you know, my bum is flapping a little bit. Liverpool meeting Stephen French, one of the most notorious gangsters to have ever come from the city. I'd already spent a day running around with the devil and found out that he had survived the recent attempt on his life. On the fucking floor now! And more worrying for me, his attempted killers were still at large. You know, me bum is flapping a little bit. Liverpool is the 2008 city of culture, but it also has a dark underbelly. Gun crime. <laughs> Merseyside's elite crime fighting unit, the Matrix, has seized hundreds of weapons, from replicas to military issue automatics. I needed to understand why Stephen was a target and how he got to be so feared and unpopular. When I was a taxman and I was taxing people, yeah, it was a destitute time out there, right? And I, I was of the Malcolm X school, by any means necessary, that wants to build this reputation, I wants to be known as a bad man. He'd steal off the kind of people who couldn't go to the police. Like, excuse me, I've just had five kilos of cocaine stolen off me and 320,000 pounds of illegitimate money. You know, that shouldn't have in my wardrobe or under the bed. And good on him. Then people need to be fucking robbed. Even though robbing criminals made Stephen enemies, he didn't care. Yeah, sometimes I'd have somebody in a situation where I was liberating them from their funds, yeah? And they wouldn't even know it was me. I'd lift up my balakov and say, it's me, the devil, what are you gonna do about it? And this was how the reputation be began to grow and grow because I actually believe that nobody could touch me and that I was one of the fiercest men on the planet. Stephen French is a survivor and his instinct was honed growing up in Toxteth in the 70s. These were deprived streets where only the tough survived. To make things worse, Liverpool was one of the most racist cities in Europe. The skinheads in Liverpool carried bag chains. I've been whipped and have the mark on the back of my neck to show it. The Boundary Pub was literally that. It separated the black ghetto from white Liverpool. Crossing the boundary involved hand-to-hand -hand combat with skinhead gangs just to go down to the city centre. At that time, we had a brutal, brutal police force. Mm. Yeah, it was racist to its core. The first time I was assaulted off a cop when I was 11, yeah. whacked in the face with a torch. This kind of police brutality was a recipe for only one thing, revenge. In 1981, it all kicked off with one of the UK's fiercest ever race riots. They came under a fusillade of bricks and stones and whatever. They arrested some kid over the bike. And, and that's what it was over, yeah, yeah just that. That was the spark, Dan. Yeah. Get me, it wasn't yeah. over that. This so was it was a build-up. This it was is a... the tensions have been building for yeah. years. A police van drove past, and a guy shouted out the window, you black bastard. Where's the sense in that? This tension exploded in nine days of sustained violence against the police, and Stephen was right in the thick of it. I, I think Stephen, um, his persona, his personality, built basically around the talks of riots. Me, my own personal involvement in yeah. riots was, was was as a frontline warrior. Yeah, because I was this close to the police officers, and I was just it was it was the release yeah. And, and, yeah. and letting go of the frustration and the tension to force the police all the way down to here. Mm. They'd never, never, never experienced that kind of ferocity because everything was on fire. Yeah. I can remember. Picking up a bin lid, picking up a stick, and starting to move forward, but rhythmically banging the floor. And everybody followed suit, right? Yeah. It was like the Zulus. I've never felt a feeling of power yeah. like that. Or yeah. to see these it's like a massive enemies, release, isn't it? You yeah, know what I mean? see the enemy on the run, and they got slaughtered. One civilian was killed, and 468 policemen were left injured. 
500 people were arrested and 70 buildings burnt to the ground. We broke the mould of not being able to come out of our community and not being able to go to town. Yeah. And that night, over those few days, the foot was surely taken off yeah. and rammed up them. Yeah, and it was, man, damn. Yeah. The feeling was fantastic. Yeah. Better than sex. In the aftermath of the riots, as the city nursed its wounds, Stephen was reborn. And I can remember raising my head to the sky and letting out a primeval roar of victory. French wanted to show me where the front line of the riots were on Upper Parliament Street, but he was feeling uneasy about all the attention we were getting. The camera draws attention. Yeah. They don't want to get, you know, use the professionals, they don't want to get you drawn into my shit, so we'll be quick, in and out. Yeah, okay. good boy. All right. Good man, OK. After only a few minutes, French pulls the plug. He feels that he's putting himself and me in unnecessary danger. Later on, I found out that he had every reason to be on guard. Someone had tried to kill Stephen in broad daylight only four weeks ago. We hopped back in the motor so he could show me where it happened. This is where I was shot at four weeks ago. You were shot up here? Yeah, it's just... Yeah. And, and there's four or five of them standing here, but they see me coming, and they've got it into the mind that I'm coming back for them, Dan. Oh, OK. Like, yeah. that I've seen one day. But he's seeing me, and he's kind of running over that way, running right. away from me. But as he's running, he's, 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 he's popping shots. Now, this is a 730. He's, not, he's, he's, he's in the space there. Yeah. This is a 730 BMW. It's a massive car. Yeah. So earnest was his, his effort that not even a bullet touched the car. There were five shots fired in total. One of them ended up in a house across the street. The family who live here refused to go on camera. It was clear to me that this is a community in the grip of fear. The shooting was in the middle of the day, but like many crimes in Liverpool, there are no witnesses. There are people who've still got a grudge against Stephen, and because they don't like him speaking out against the gangs which are coming up who are armed with guns, they don't like his anti-gun stance. But obviously, you can't fight fire with fire like that, but how do you confront that? I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, my hands are tied in terms of I can't retaliate in kind, right? Because look, I hope I hope I bump into one of them in the supermarket and I'll spank them like I'm the daddy. Do you yeah. understand, right? Yeah. I'll give them a hell of a kicking, right? Yeah. But I don't want to shoot anybody. I nah. don't want to kill anybody. They're jokers. They can't even hit a barn door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Right? I was feeling very uneasy. Stephen clearly had lots of enemies, but I was shocked that someone had tried to take him out so recently. That freaked me out. I knew it was going to be a bit ropey filming in Liverpool, Cockney running about with a camera. But when we was with him, I thought we were safe. But actually, there was still a lot to learn about the geezer. The next day, I was invited down to the gym to find out how Stephen had become such a potent force in the underworld. The mighty Bruce Lee. Street fighter. He's a former British, European, and world kickboxing champion. Martial arts instilled in Stephen the Japanese warrior code of Bushido, which he would obey throughout his life. I want to show you how important the honor and integrity is, is to me. Because I, as, as a 10 hour sitting, yeah. 10 hours pure pain. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Got it, yeah. That's who I am, that's what I'm about, and I wear it on my back, that's with me for my life. This, this dragon is on it, this dragon on this side is integrity, and within side, in the middle, is the beast. I'm the beast within. If you cross the twin dragons of honor and integrity, the beast within is released. Yeah. And once the beast is released, the only way you can put him back in his cage is to sate him, which is to feed him, or to slay him, which is to kill him. And that's the way I live my life. If you cross me, you've got to feed me or you've got to kill me. And it's as simple as that. Mad way to live your life, you know what I mean? It's, no, it's a cold, man. It's, 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 a, cold. it's, a, it's a discipline and it's, it's something that you live by. It's a cold. And if you, if you die by that cold, or you live by that cold, you can say that you, you've remained true to something in your life. The person responsible for teaching Hello. Stephen this code was to become the most influential figure in his life. Sensei Ronnie Colwell, legendary founding father of British karate. He's my sensei, my mentor, my guide, and my white father. 
All these people who are angry and frustrated, no opportunities, no education, you know, no motivation, fighting against the system. And this one man could walk in the room, they'd all just stand there in attention. He might not look hard, but if he wanted to, Sensei Colwell could probably kill you with his bare hands. He's an eighth dan karate, Shotokan, fifth dan jujitsu, ninth dan um, aikido. He teaches SAS, special forces, military, still to this day. I remember saying to him, look, you've got something. Inside of you, there's something very special. Ronnie showed me how to be a man. This, this, this. His effect on me was profound. From a small gym in the ghetto, Ronnie Colwell transformed Stephen and seven others into world champions. Their bright red tracksuits were revered around the world. I wasn't about to cross Stephen's twin dragons of honor and integrity. Imagining the devil in his prime being unleashed was a frightening fall. I felt sorry for anyone who had crossed him in the past. Making these films become a whole new thing for me, you know what I mean? It's not about bravado and giving it a big one and, you know, I'm the toughest man in Liverpool. I ain't really been a sense of that. I feel I've learned something about him, but at the same time, I know absolutely nothing about him and I still don't know, you know, whether he's liable to do the switch at any point. The skills French learned in the ring he soon put into practice on the street. He was part of a new generation of criminal, young, black, and angry. In 1986, he teamed up with his best pal, Andrew John, to take over the doors here at the Grafton, one of the most notorious clubs in Liverpool. They directly challenged the white Liverpool mafia who controlled the lucrative drugs trade. At the time we did that, right, it was when me, Andrew and myself were feeding off each other and we were at the height of our physical powers. We believed we were invincible. If French had a hard reputation, Andrew Johns was even tougher. Together, Stephen and AJ were an unstoppable team. Blood brothers, karate champions and partners in crime. It was a dangerous chem chemistry, yeah, because we could walk into a room and we could just, we could walk into a club and empty a club. Andrew John's brothers remember some of his battles, which are the stuff of urban legend. Nine doormen pulling up koshers and baseball bats and just went through them like paper. Mm -hmm. And the people on the till and the bar and all that all shit themselves. At the time, some nightclubs were whites only, but not for long. We went to the club. We rendered about four or five of the doormen unconscious and all the black youths in. You've got a no nigger policy here, yeah, right? And I use that word because that was the word we used then. Yeah. Cuffed them, went inside, poured the champagne, drank the champagne, let the black lads in and told them that they couldn't do that. Your black pals were in a bar drinking champagne. How does that make you feel? In control of my own life, in control of my own destiny, and that nobody could fuck with us. Yeah. Backing up Stephen on the door was a crew of world champion fighters. We were a phenomenal crew. We were a scary crew and we took no shit. Yeah. And what you've got to remember is that this was a colour bar club. Yeah. Right? Before he could tell me more, we're suddenly interrupted by someone from inside the Grafton. Oh, right. pal. It's um, no one's like, giving you any permission to this filming. How you doing, mate? Yeah, we're just filming it uh, outside, you know. Huh? We're finished now, we're going. Yeah, we're done now, mate. Yeah. Okay. What it is, is that I was rejected in the 80s. Yeah, I know, I know who you are, Steve. Okay. And, and it was just gonna... Once again, it looks like Stephen's reputation precedes him, and we're moved on. What's up, mate? Come Listen, look, at the end of the day, we got it anyway, didn't we? Yeah. No, he knows exactly who you are, and he just wants a pound note to doesn't he? But actually, well, yeah, well, no, he's a fucking idiot. I was thinking, I'm going to cough this right? But, but I, as always, I have to suppress those ages. I haven't mellowed, because the fire still rages inside. The beast is still there. I was getting a glimpse of the beast that lurked inside Stephen French's psyche. I'd heard so many rumours about him, I didn't know what to believe. We stopped off at Stephen's favourite restaurant for a spot of lunch. And I asked him what he thought about the reputation he had in Liverpool. The people that you're talking to only know Stephen French the warrior. They don't know Stephen French the friend. They don't know him the brother, they don't know him the son, and they don't know him as the father. Because right? they're other facets, they just know me with, with uh, my war face on and 
the reason why I'm such a formidable foe. Death doesn't hold any fear for me. Stephen French broke the shackles of his white oppressor in the 1981 race riots and became a man. I can remember raising my head to the sky and letting out a primeval roar of victory. He trained himself into a world kickboxing champion. Now he turned his attention to his full-time occupation, taxing drug dealers. A new drug hit the streets in the mid-80s that would change the face of the underworld forever and allegedly make Stephen French a mint. If I could phone someone now and order a kilo of crack for 30 grand, I wouldn't have to touch it. I'd give it to 10 people to sell for me. I'd make 15,000 pounds and then pay back. It's easy, it's too easy. But more drug dealers meant only one thing to Stephen, more business. At his peak, he was rumored to be taxing a dealer a week, earning hundreds of thousands of pounds for just a few hours work. Stephen had agreed to give me a unique insight into his past as an underworld tax man. Now I was on my way to meet him in a secret location in the suburbs. I didn't know it yet, but I was only minutes away from one of the maddest experiences of my life. I've asked Danny Dyer to meet me here this afternoon, right, with a view to showing him a taxation scenario. These are the things that are actually going on today. They're quite horrific and scary, but this is the insight that I want the viewer to have, and those of the squeamish should look away. This is the first time a real-life taxation scenario has ever been shown on TV. Stephen was taking a big risk by opening up this side to me, but I got the feeling he was on his own journey to atone for some of the things that happened in the past. You know, this guy is known as the tax man. You know, his nickname was the devil, and there was a reason for that, and the fact that, you know, he used to rob drug dealers, and he used to, you know, um, I don't know, torture them, I don't know what he used to do to them, but, um, you know, I need to get a sense of that. You know, obviously not too much, you know what I mean? It's time to get into character. It's time for the switch to be flipped. I don't want to scare the guy. I don't want to glamorize taxation, but I want to show the nitty-gritty nuts, nuts and bolts of what actually used to take place. Here we go. With the taxation. Right, let's have it. So the door's already open, so it's like, OK, sweet, let's go in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Even if you want to start struggling, right? If I put it on you now, Dan, you're yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. only holding you. Yeah. yeah. Right? Cool. Oh, it would be. Yeah. Yeah? Straight lifted. Away. You're going to be awake for about three seconds. Mm. You lift it, you put down in a chair. Right? And then the individual, the people that had him, would secure him in the chair. Yeah. Yeah? Hands and feet to secure him in the chair. Yeah? Keep him quiet. Yeah. But they leave his eyes open. I've had some geezers, and I started to mouth off, blah, 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 who do you think you are, blah, 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 and I just jammed the eye, you get me, just jammed the eye, and just, you know, give them, give them some sharp pain, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. and say to them, well, you know, shut up, because next time your eye will come out, next yeah. time I'll pop your eye out, if you want to come out to the sunscape, behave yourself, be respectful, the individual that now had you would be dressed in head to toe in black, they'd have a black ballet glove and black gloves on, right, and you wouldn't be able to see who they wear, they have a really large kitchen knife, yeah? And the first thing they do is walk over to you and they show you the knife and put the knife down, yeah? And then the rhetoric possibly would go something like this. I fucking hate drug dealers. I fucking hate people that sell drugs to children and their own communities, but I fucking love money. I'm here to relieve you of your cash. If you don't give me your cash, really horrible, nasty things are gonna to happen to you. But it's all a matter for you. I don't wanna to have to harm you. I don't wanna to have to hurt you. 
But you, you're poisoning communities. You're killing people. And you're getting fat and rich off it. And that disgusts me. You disgust me. So it's a matter for you. I've got a phone here. Fresh, clean phone, never been used. You're gonna call your stash minder, whether it's your fucking granny, your ma, your bird, your best pal, and you're gonna make it good. And you're gonna tell them, in about an hour, someone's coming to pick up the money. And you're gonna to have to act like you've never yeah. fucking acted before. And yeah. if, you, if you use any codes, like, I know you're referred to as Danny, if you say something like it's Daniel on the phone, I know you're using a code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. fucking try any of that shit, because yeah. I've been here before. I'm a professional. Mm. This is what I do. And this is how the individual will be made to feel. It'd be overwhelmed psychologically. Mm. And if you don't do that, this is what's going to happen to you. Stephen's told us not to broadcast what he's whispering in my ear. It's too upsetting. But I can tell you, it's not something I'll forget. What Something along those lines, Dan. Yeah? Well, I, I'd, I'd pull up the dough immediately. I'd yeah. pull up the dough, man. I'd just think... To my shame and to my embarrassment, it's stripping them of the dignity. I've had a 17-stone fucking bodybuilder come in and shit his kicks. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. Proper mess his trousers. Yeah. yeah. Piss himself because they don't know what's going to happen. And this is why taxation is such a nasty, evil activity. I regret it 100%. And one of the reasons why I'm speaking about it now, I'm being quite graphic about it, is to bring it to the wider public of what it's all about. Yeah, I've just got a sense of what that could be like, and I'll just feel yeah, that. You know, if it's done correctly, nobody gets hurt physically. But I actually believe, in retrospect, the emotional and mental damage that it can cause to an individual leaves me ashamed. Um, oh. I mean, it's hard to feel sorry for a smack dealer, do you know what I mean? But uh, you would think, you know, that, 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 is, that is the worst case scenario. I don't see how you come back from that. I can't really understand how anyone wouldn't pull up the dough or wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do as they're told, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, that's freaked me out a little bit. That's done me. I feel a bit sick. I feel like I'm going to chuck my breakfast up. I needed to take a breather and get some fresh air. Luckily, before too long, I was back to my old self. All right, girls. Hiya. You all right, love? A couple of salts. Right up my street. French no longer taxes anyone, but he still trades off his hard man reputation to make money. But this time, legitimately, as a self-styled problem solver extraordinaire and commercial debt recoverer. He invited me to follow him on a debt. Radisson, there's a guy there waiting to see me. I'll wait here for you, yeah? I've jumped straight in the motor. He's had to stop off somewhere, go and pick something up. Don't know what. So, uh, you know, obviously they're going to do as I'm told. I don't know what he's after, I don't know what he's got to get. He's coming now, so I'm going to be lively. Sorted. Sweet ass. Well, mate, sweet ass. It's only taken minutes, but Stephen's just picked up 10 grand. Sweet ass. So to get that money back, it's usually just a bit of dialogue you just need to use, yeah? It's as simple as this, Dan, right? If I say to you, if you don't pay me the money that you fucking owe me, I'm going to snap your legs in about four places. Yeah. I broke the law. Yeah. If I come to you and I say to you, you owe the money, you know what's the right thing to do. Uh, you know who I am, you know what I'm about, so pay the money. Yeah. I haven't broken no laws. Yeah. In the early 90s, Stephen was at the peak of his powers as the country's most feared tax man. When something happened that shook him to his core and would change his life forever. I was in the afternoon on Granby Street and I was shot four times in the back by a dirty coward. I just couldn't believe Andrew was dead. It took 45 minutes for them to come and take him to the hospital. And an ambulance come to the end of the street after five minutes, but because it was a gun crime, he had to wait for unresponse. response. That was another 40 minutes. And I actually believed that it was the end of the world, that 
that my world had come to an end. Every year on the anniversary of Andrew's murder, Stephen and his brothers meet up to pay tribute to him. By the way, they're trying to get me to link up with you a little bit sooner than I'm ready. Just took a few shots at me this year, kid. But I'm still here. A lot of bullshit going on. Not that I can't handle. A lot of people that don't like me say it should have been me. And it shouldn't have been him. And it transpires that the guy that killed Andrew had more reason to want to kill me. And the reason why he had more reason to want to kill me is that he believed I was responsible for doing something terrible to him. You can listen to as many conspiracy theories as possible. It's not going to bring my brother back. So at the end of the day, Andrew's murder was the catalyst for Stephen to start reassessing his life. And I believe that I was protected and I was saved for the reason. I've been there, I've seen it, I've done it. Listen to me. There's another way. Lay down your firearms. Embrace education and learn to look after your family other than pistolero or drug dealer. If I save one young man, black, white, Chinese are indifferent from ending up in a premature grave due to gun violence and crime. It will all have been worthwhile. Today, Stephen has been invited to speak to a delegation of high-profile criminologists and academics to help spread his anti-gun message. In his friend's memory, he plans to open the Andrew John Memorial Skill Centre to prevent teenagers from following in his footsteps. Will it be a happy ending or want to regret success, prison or death, I need to watch our... It's a humbling and liberating experience to be invited to speak here today. He hopes the speech will help raise funding for the Skill Centre. I have to bear responsibility and culpability in the rise of the phenomenon known as gun crime. I'm six foot three, 225 pounds of prime black male. And how could a 10 stone drug stealer protect himself from a guy like me, former British, European, and world kickboxing champion? How he did it is he armed himself. 1994, my daughter was born and I had an epiphany. I knew I had to turn my life around. My options were success, death, or jail. Me personally, I want to show them the way to success. I want to show them the road to success. Success as a bricklayer. Success as a plumber. Success as a carpenter. All areas of success that don't lead to jail or death and don't lead to a life of drugs or pistolero. This is done to shock and horrify, yeah? This is a t-shirt that several young men had made that have made an attempt on my life because I'm standing up to be counted and, and given an anti-gun message, R.I.P. Stephen French. Such is my determination, I've changed R.I.P. to really increase the peace. Thank you very much for the time and effort. <laughs> that was nerve-wracking for me. And even the fact that he's trying to change uh, is an achievement, because when, when you've been knees deep in high-level organized crime for 20 years, it's really difficult to turn your back on it. With a young family, an extra responsibility, Stephen was determined to turn over a new leaf. But going straight was going to be the hardest thing Stephen French has ever done. Stephen was at the peak of his powers in the underworld when he gave it all up in the 90s. The death of his blood brother and partner in crime, Andrew John, had a dramatic impact on his life. And actually believed that it was the end of the world. He moved out of Toxteth and now lives across the river in leafy suburbia, where he runs a successful property portfolio and debt recovery business. 
I wanted to get to the bottom of why Stephen had been shot at recently, so he invited me to his house to show me around. He survived seven assassination attempts, so it's no surprise that Stephen is security conscious. He'll protect his family at all costs. The gangsters today don't discern between you, your family or your associates. If they can get at, at you by killing your daughter or kidnapping your daughter, they will do. I was about to discover that Stephen had an Achilles heel that was a lot closer to home. This is my family war. And the problem didn't come from outside. It come from his own flesh and blood. Stephen Jr. Uh, was, was involved in gangs. He was starting to get into the criminal lifestyle. There was nothing Stephen could do to prevent his son from sinking deeper into crime. He blames himself to a degree that Stephen Jr. is behaving like he is because he's trying to live up to his dad's reputation and stuff. And Stephen's worst nightmare came true when his son was shot. <laughs> When I seen my own son's blood being collected in, 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 um, in a container, the big, bad, wicked, devil, Frenchman, blubbered like a baby. The tears were uncontrollable. My Stephen said to me, Dad, 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 don't cry, don't cry, I'm okay, I'm fine. Because he resented the fact that I was broken. Every ounce of my fiber, every ounce of my warrior being called out to attack and wreak havoc. That's what my heart told me. The demon that I can summon on in an instant was rattling the cage, man, rattling the cage. And I had to control that demon. I had to control that demon. Since the shooting, Stephen Jr. has left Liverpool to successfully rebuild his life but his dad is still dealing with the fallout. Stephen's enemies have gone to great lengths to assassinate his character, even tagging the walls with graffiti, accusing him of being a police informer. Being called the grass is like someone calling you a paedophile. And then once that label's put on you, uh, you're fair game to be shot. This home footage shows just what he thinks of the person responsible. A little skulky little bitch that runs around in the evening painting shit on the wall about a man that he's so jealous of, so envious of. The greenness is oozing out here. I challenge any journalist in the country to find or dig out the statement where somebody's received a custodial sentence from something that I did because I've never police informed on anybody. The bitterness against Stephen and his family runs deep with the new generation in Toxter. I wanted to track down who these kids were that now control the streets and find out for myself what they think of Stephen. A gang of them agreed to speak, provided their identities were hidden. I heard he could be the of the week right there where we're standing now. And um, he got shot at now, so you tell me if he come through here again, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> He might have been feared back in the day, but obviously it's 2008. Well, things have changed and he's not feared no more. Stephen French is a grass. He's a pussy. These kids were hiding behind their masks, but Stephen still has to take their threat seriously. I sleep on the couch and my wife and daughter sleep upstairs because my address is no secret. And if, if people choose to come to my house, choose to break into my house and then attempt to murder me, they'll find me downstairs. But the people that come for me, they're not gonna come with Ludo and Tiddlywinks, yeah? 3845 pump popping shotguns is what's gonna be the recipe for me. In the face of that, I stay here. In the face of that, as a black Englishman, 
I'm entitled to defend my castle. And this is a phrase I use for only trusted family and friends. This is one hard nigger to kill. This is one hard nigger to kill. Even though Stephen forgives those people who want to kill him, he still has to control his natural instinct to fight back. So, I mean, how, how hard has it been to sort of turn your back on that world, you know? And... Well, the transition has been very, very difficult. At times, the, 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 the desire to say, fuck this, let's do it again then, right? Because some, some of the people, like, that, that are coming at me now, right? They're like Jack Russells snapping at the heels of a Rothwheeler. Do you get me? That if, if I wanted to, I could shake them. Yeah. If I wanted to, I could turn their lives upside down. If I wanted to, I could make them have nightmares about me. I could make them see me in a dream because the, 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 the fire, yeah. the, the will to crush your enemies is still there. But I'm a different person. I have to lead by example. I don't want to be murdered. I don't want to die a violent death. But if that's my lot, so be it. You understand? Because someone has to take a stand, someone has to stand up, and we have to start somewhere to start to readjust the balance of what's going on. Stephen French helped break the stranglehold of racism in the 80s with his bare fists. He should be a hero in the community. Instead, because of his anti-gun campaign, he's hated by a new generation of gangsters. He's put his life on the line for something that he believes in. And there's no greater honor than that. You cannot stop him in any of the conventional terms. I know in my heart, in my mind, and in my soul, in my kukuru, my inner heart, what type of man I am. I choose to stay here and campaign against guns and do what I'm doing because I'm giving something back. In today's gang wars, the rules of engagement have changed radically since Stephen's day. I've learned that teenage gangs fear no one, and they'll shoot you to prove it. Stephen is nearly 50 years old, but he's lost none of his will to fight. He's going to the ultimate lengths to battle gun crime by putting his own life on the line. I'm just glad I met Stephen now, and not in his day, when he was one of Britain's deadliest men.